us in the renewing of our mind, who we might be more faithful in our commitment to you and our love of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we uh, progress to the slide for today? It's all on one PD, PPT, PowerPoint. Point. PowerPoint. All right. <laughs> this is Dr. Owen Anderson at Historic Christian Church of Phoenix, and we're continuing our Sunday School series on our church's distinctives. And we've had a, a session already on what distinctives are. And today we're to the biblical worldview. Now, this follows from last time when we were talking about the necessity for Scripture. And before that, when we were talking about the clarity of God's existence. So these are going in order and building on one another. And someone could ask and say, well, just hold on a minute. Doesn't every church, certainly every Reformed church, hold to the biblical worldview? So that's not a distinctive. Well, the distinctives don't necessarily mean things that are completely unique and no one else holds, because we believe that we're not, you know, there's lots of churches and uh, they also teach uh, scriptures and gospel, but there are things that give us our specific identity and that we emphasize. And I think you'll see as we get into this that we're emphasizing particular points of this that connect up with our highest good in a way that may not be emphasized elsewhere. And we've shown how that is coming out of the Westminster Confession. So it's certainly there in the Reformed tradition, but may be overlooked. So the biblical worldview is summarized in three main concepts, creation, fall, and redemption. And that's really the Christian narrative. So again, you might say, yeah, that's what is always taught. And, and really, you might suggest that that's any narrative. I mean, if you started a story, you, you go to a movie, and the movie starts off, and they're doing something, and it continues. In the middle, they're doing the same thing. And at the end of the movie, they're still doing that thing. That wasn't a movie, right? Nothing. There was no arc of any kind of change and conflict and overcoming and resolution. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So this is uh, what I just had said. Showing, having shown all we need redemptive revelation, we now are left asking, which book is it? Of the, of the books that are out there, which book is it? And how many options are there? I've, I've encountered people before who they say, yeah, I've studied all the religions. And they're basically the same. The first half of that is, is good. You should study the religions. The second half is, is simply false. And I don't mean only because Christianity doesn't teach that, but it, it overlooks the uniqueness of all of the religions, right? Each of them says, I don't teach what the other guys teach. Uh, they might say, I'm like the pinnacle of the others. They all lead to me. But you should get to know the world religions and what makes them distinct, why they're not just the same thing. So there aren't really that many options. I'm going to suggest that when we get into it, there's only one option. And having shown we need Scripture, and there's only one option, we know it is Scripture. Narrow it down. So if we've done our work ahead of time, by the time we get to Genesis, we're all set. Wasn't that nice? See how much energy that would save you? You know that's one of the, the distinctives of being a philosopher is a certain kind of laziness. Yeah, efficiency. Good. See, yeah. Well, yeah, it's more like uh, an ounce of prevention instead of a pound of cure. So you come to it and you know what scripture is. So we're looking for a book that does the following. It teaches only God is eternal. Well, that limits, that narrows it down quite uh, dramatically because many of the other world's religions are monist. They teach all is one. That's their highest truth. That you have, to, you have to go through many levels of uh, enlightenment to get to their highest truth, which is that all is one, you are God. We're going to see that temptation in Genesis 3. That's the original temptation. 
So only God is eternal. Now, I'll, I'll have to give you a test later and see how far do you have to get into Genesis before you find this out. Like eight or nine chapters, chapter 51. Have you read chapter 51 of Genesis? That's about uh, Abraham teaching how all the religions should get along. Benjamin Franklin wrote it and put it into his Bible. And he would have debates with pastors. And he'd say, well, you seem to be violating Genesis 51. And he'd say, what are you talking about? And flip to it and say, see what Abraham says right here? So, yeah, how do you know what, what that's what we're going over. Like, well, how do we know what the content of the Bible is? Uh, as opposed to someone adding something. So only God's eternal. You don't even have to get into the first chapter. This is Genesis 1.1. Right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So God's already there. He didn't have a beginning. So you get a statement right away of what's eternal and what isn't eternal. Isn't that nice how it just gets right to it? Second, it's clear that God exists. Not merely that God exists and a few people can kind of scratch their way to God's existence. But that very first sentence also tells us it's clear. Some things are eternal and some things aren't. And confusing those is, is the most basic and problematic error. So the very first test in history will be about that. Did you keep these two distinct? Third, that sin begins in unbelief and the rejection of what is clear. Remember, we're not coming to Scripture looking for more information. Like a new, like uh, an almanac of interesting historical facts. We're we're coming to it looking for redemption, redemptive knowledge. So it presupposes sin, and it has to get sin right. And one of the main competitors would say sin is just an act of the will. Sin is when you've been given a law by God, so you have it and you break it. That's a very common view even among Christians. They'll, they'll define sin that way. I heard a Christian say that on a TV show. Sin is when you knowingly do evil. Well, no, there's also culpable ignorance. When you don't know what you should have. So we would expect to be introduced to sin right away as unbelief, and that's going to be the thread problem through the whole scripture is how to deal with unbelief. And then fourth... That natural evil shows that God will redeem us. It's precisely because of natural evil in the world that we can expect Scripture. If God was going to not redeem us, God was going to leave us to ourselves forever in sin, then God wouldn't have imposed natural evil to get us to stop and think. Going through Lamentations today in my daily reading, Jeremiah says that all of these things happened so we might think. So that's a common theme in the scripture. So we would expect that right away to learn that about natural evil. Think about some of the alternatives about natural evil, right? Uh, natural evil is a, is a punishment mostly. It's when God's getting you. Or it's not even have to do with God at all. It's like it's just from an evil deity. And you have to overcome this evil deity. That's what the uh, dualists would teach. And the polytheists would teach that. There's a, there's a god of death who's bad. Or it's just natural, right? Just part of life. Your body just naturally gets old, sick, and dies. There's no purpose or reason for it. Just, just a random in one sense. So this is what we're looking for when we consider what, what is natural evil. And then fifth, redemptive revelation is about how God is both just and merciful. So that's, again, what we're looking for. We're not looking merely for a theology book. We have general revelation, which teaches us about the nature of God. How will God be both just and merciful? That's a, that's a biblical mystery, not a... Uh, Worldly mystery, which is like a contradiction. 
or something. But a biblical mystery, a normal mystery, when you read a mystery book, you expect things to get figured out at the end. Yeah. So that's what a biblical mystery is like. You figure it out eventually. You're told what the answer is. So redemptive revelation is about that. So we're going to look at Genesis and see how far do we have to get into the Bible before we're alerted to whether or not it is meeting these criteria. Now, why should we have criteria? I can imagine somebody, uh, call them a Vantillian, say, well, you're imposing criterion on the Bible that are man-made. You just have to accept it. What would you say? Yeah, these are more like presuppositions on a man-made criterion. But why would you just have to accept it? Well, because it's God's word. Well, how do you know, how do you know that? It, it says it is. Well, there's a number of books that say they are. You just have to accept those too. So that's why we don't go that route. These aren't man-made criteria, and these are flowing from what we can know from general revelation about God and sin. Next. Ooh, I need to make bigger. Uh, next time I'm going to make bigger font for old guys up here trying to read it. Redemptive. Yeah, I have to turn it. Turn it. Down. Redemptive revelation teaches these three ideas: creation, fall, and redemption. So we went over that already. Let's go to the next one. So Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think you can make the case that no, there is no more sublime. Perfect sentence. The only competitor might be John 1.1, 1, 1, but that's building on Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. But no book begins in more perfection than that sentence. Can you think of one? Oh, muse, let me sing of the wrath of Achilles. That doesn't, that's kind of interesting. Like, why is he mad? But it's not close to this. There was a hole in a shire in which lived a hobbit. No, right? no. Yeah, they're all correcting me. Like, getting, I, I'm using the New English translation of... Uh, so, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How perfect. It directs our attention right where it must go. It tells us who God is and what isn't God. And you're to remember that difference for all of history. It tells us about the work of God. God created the heavens and the earth, which is a, a Hebrew euphemism for all things. Nothing exists that wasn't made by God. God alone was there in the beginning. And then we get into a description of creation, which for our purposes today, we're not going through through those, except for to note that the creation was very good. No evil. And that's what we would expect. We could know that from general revelation. We would know that ahead of time. Creation was very good because God is perfect in goodness. And so we get this teaching that the creation reveals its creator. And that's not, that shouldn't surprise you. Like, wow, I never thought of that. That's what any work does. When you see someone's handiwork, it tells you about them, right? That'd be true in, in any kind of work you can think of, but obviously building something, painting something, that tells you about that, the, the maker, the creator. So too with the works of God, and that's how we know God. So as we sing the Psalms, we're often reminded and called upon to direct our attention to the works of God. Remember the works of God. So that is taught to us right here. And that that's our highest good. Can you think of any greater good than that? You're already probably like biased about it. Yeah, I can't. But I mean, try it. What else could be more better than you're getting to know the eternal one? Well, is there a retirement deal? Is there like a dental plan also? Like, like what else could be better than that? You get to know God. That's the highest good from the very beginning. So just from the first sentence, we see, yes, this is it. 
Nothing else affirms this. And you can, you can take it as a kind of uh, homework challenge to scroll through them. There's web pages that have all the world's religions texts and you can scroll through their first sentence and compare to them this first sentence. Now, some of them might be derivative, meaning they come after Genesis and therefore they're clearly parroting Genesis. Um, but so it's good to look at distinct ones that don't have that kind of influence on each other and see if they came up with something other than this. We also have man commanded, given a first command. I often ask about that. What's the first command? And sometimes they'll get to don't eat of the tree, but they rarely remember that there was a command before that. 22. God blesses them, man and woman, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas. Oh, sorry, that's uh, not man and woman yet. Um, 28. Be fruitful, multiply, so I got mistaken, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So be fruitful and multiply. What does that mean? Well, we're given this work already. They're connected up. Fruitful multiply is connected up to have dominion. You can't do the dominion if there's only two of you or four of you or even 80 of you. Think about the progress we've made as humans and how much labor it's taken to get to where we're at. Even if we were to have like a list of the supposed great people, like we'd, we'd attribute all of Apple to uh, Steve Jobs, but that would be incorrect, right? There was, what's his name? Is it Steve Wozniak, the co-founder? And then there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of engineers who are actually doing this, making this stuff. And that's just Apple. You know, think about all the developments that have happened. So, But even if you just listed the great people, that'd be a long list to memorize, let alone all of those who contributed to understanding the nature of the world God made. So you want to do that. And that's only natural dominion. There's a clear lack of moral dominion. Think of the moral progress we've made as you were to look back in history and you think about what it's been like before. The lack of morality inside at times. Um, so any progress we've made, how much work that's taken also. So the being fruitful is connected to that. It's not just numbers. Like we had more kids than you, so we were more fruitful. Yeah, but they're all unbelievers. So they contributed negatively to dominion, not positively to dominion. So you're to be fruitful. You don't want to populate the world with canes. You want to populate the world with Abel's. Now, I'm not laying that at every parent, like, oh, they did something wrong with Cain, and they learned a lesson and had to change with Abel. Uh, not at all. But that's the parent's duty insofar as they have any influence over that. They're supposed to be teaching their kids these things to get them into the battle uh, of good and evil. So we have that command from the beginning. Be fruitful, multiply, having dominion, filling the earth. If you fill the earth with Believers, you've filled the earth with the knowledge of God. So do you see how Isaiah 11, 9 connects to the very first commandment? The earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. Post-millennial, Genesis 1 is post-millennial. From the very beginning, we're expecting this. Even before the fall, we're expecting the world to be filled with the knowledge of God. And not somewhere else, incidentally. Like uh, the earth blows itself up and we remove ourselves to Mars. Uh, no, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. The earth will be renewed. And then last, this gets us in chapter two, God resting from his work. We'll see a few things here that are pictures of what it'll be for mankind also. Mankind also rests from his work. There's a promise that you'll, be, that you'll finish your work. Next. So in the chapter two, we have marriage. Again, we're not necessarily studying chapters one through three. Simpliciter, that's not our purpose this morning. It's to think about the biblical worldview. But some people have troubles with chapter one and two. They think it's two separate creation accounts. As opposed to in chapter two, we get greater detail about what already happened when man and woman were created in chapter one. It's not even a very hard problem to solve. I'm not sure why people get caught up on that. So... We get 
the introduction of, of marriage, which is the theme. Someone could say that's the theme of the book. It starts with marriage. It ends with marriage. So I told you that before, that that is how all the Shakespearean comedies work out. Shakespeare is imitating Christian history. It's called Christian history. But that's how Christian, the Christian narrative goes. And when I was starting and talking about narratives, and I was saying you, you expect that anytime you go to a movie or read a book, that's just what a narrative is. So all of these attempts to tell different stories are like little imitations of God's story. That's the story, what God's doing in history. And then humans in their secondary level of imagination come up with their own as well. And they're, I, think, I think the extent to which they get close to what God is doing is the extent to which we relate to them or not. The further they are from that, the less relatable they are. Because there's still something in us that speaks to creation, fall, which is trouble, redemption, resolution, outcome. So marriage throughout this, and you get uh, that as a picture of what God is doing. Just as God, it's like uh, the husband and wife are picture of God and the church. Church meaning all the believers. So you have that right from the beginning, co uh, combined with a command, a covenant. It speaks about God making every tree, including the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And 16 and 17, the covenant. Covenant means an agreement, the promising of life or death. Keeping it means life. Breaking it means death. The day you eat, you'll surely die. And every time that the larger catechism goes over the moral law, the commandment says that every time you have a negative, the positive is implied. And the other way is true as well. When there's a positive, the negative is implied. So the day you don't eat, you won't die, is implied. So the day you eat, you'll surely die. All right. Now, the helper. Finding a helper. A lot of times when I ask students about this and they only remember the first half, be fruitful, they narrow down what a helper is. But you wouldn't need to go through what Adam did to figure that out. Right, that this one can't help you be fruitful. You would know that because it's each after its own kind. So you know ahead of time. But what we have pictured here is Adam doing the work of dominion, naming things. That's what that's what we're doing in dominion. Different kinds of things and naming them. And the more precision we have in naming, the more dominion we've had. Like there used to be something called consumption in the in the seventeenth. 17, 1800s, you'd get consumption. And it was like 30 different actual diseases, but they didn't know, they didn't have any precision. So, oh, you have these three uh, things wrong with you, it's consumption. But in 200 years, our medical knowledge has increased and we have more precision and therefore we're able to be more helpful uh, in prescribing things. So it's like that with this as well. Naming the animals, it's not like Bob, Henry, Fido, Bitey, uh, what kinds of things are these? The different kinds. And he finds that none of them could be a helper. Not in just be fruitful, multiply, but in having dominion over the world. And there's some remarkable animals. They're quite helpful. Have you seen those like YouTube pictures of the uh, sheepdog? Rounding up sheep, right? Or cattle horses. Uh, so some very useful animals, but not for, and, and arguably more useful than a uh, human helper, right? Like, hey, round those sheep up, right? Uh, no, it won't, won't work out as well. So, dominion. This other, what becomes Eve, who becomes Eve, is what is necessary for having that kind of help. That's what marriage is for, not something else. Not merely companionship for lonely days or... Someone to have kids with, but dominion to fill the earth with the knowledge of God. What a high calling for an institution. And you can look, you can do a study of the history of marriage and see all the ways in which people have made it about something besides that and how that ruins it. 
Then, no, sorry, stay on that one. Life and death, I mentioned that, the promising of life and the consequence of death. And that requires us to think about what is death here. Uh, if it means physical death, it's simply not true. You have to do some like gymnastics to get it to be, the day you eat, you'll start physically dying. Well, that's not what it says. The day you eat, you'll surely die. It's emphatic about that. Well, that means there must be another kind of death besides physical death. And that's actually the, the more important one in the sense that it's the, the spiritual death for which we need redemption. It's a sense in which you can be born dead in your trespasses and sins. How can you be born dead unless you're stillbirth? But that's not what I was talking about. So you're born dead. That's the spiritual death from the beginning. And life is this life of knowing God. And then man's work, touch on that, and the helper needed for the commandment in chapter one. Now the next one. We get to chapter three. Uh, the, the template for all other narratives. It's great how this unfolds. There's the serpent introduced. That wily fellow. And he tempts her with the perfect question. My thing, I'm speaking too highly of him. Like, what is... Is he your boss or something, Anderson? Like, do you, do you get money from him uh, at ASU? What's going on? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Did God really say? That's the perfect temptation. Tempting you about who God is, how you know, and the consequence. Because if he falls over that, you won't die. You'll be as God. Knowing good and evil. Now, just from the little bit of scripture they have so far, which is kind of some interactions with God commanding them to do things, how would they know God's eternal? Some guy comes along and tells you, hey, don't eat of this tree. Eternal. They would have to be engaged in using their minds to figure that out, just like we do. They don't have any special knowledge that we wouldn't have access to. So this test is testing to see if they've done that or not. That's really what we want out of education, isn't it, for our kids? There might be different paths of how we get there depending on the uniqueness of our kids. So we might have some at Montessori, some at classical ed, some at homeschool, some at public school. But the goal could be the same, which is we want our kids to learn to reason things out themselves. It's not have to be told things. If, you're, if you have employees at all or work with people under you, you know it can get quite annoying if they have to be told how to do each step. They should be able to figure certain things out for themselves. That's what we want for our children, right? To grow up, figure this out. How do you know only God's eternal? Well, it says in the Bible. So someone told you, but why do they think it? How can you know that? How could she know she can't be like God? Well, God told her, no, he hasn't. Where was that in the first two chapters? How does she know this? Oh, he'll just know it. Well, apparently not. So we get this temptation right away, and she fails, and Adam fails. Milton's wrong on this point, I think, because he has Adam somewhere else. I think he's right there, right? She just hands him, you know, he's hanging out. He could have stopped at any point. So, well, wait a minute. We're temporal. We can't be eternal. And he just goes along. He doesn't even say anything according to this. What's Adam's problem? So this temptation and her answers, what more perfect temptation? And you're, you're repeated with that every day. I found that as I was going through Augustine's confessions with my students this fall, the, 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 really the pinnacle for him is the same temptation. He's become a believer, but he's still wrestling with the sin of lust. And it gets really clearly pointed at one time when he says, he, he'd said to God, I want to overcome this, but just not yet. He still loved it. But for him, it comes a point where he, he realizes, this is almost an exact quote, my pleasures were telling me you can't live without us. That's what this is, same thing. Life is with us. If you get rid of us, you'll have death. And when he saw that, it clicked for him. No, that's the path of death. Rome, he, he opened to Romans 13. Romans 13 is the path of life. And that's what helped him overcome. It wasn't that he had a weak will and he knew the law but couldn't do it. 
He had to grow in his understanding to overcome. And that's what happened. That's why the confessions are helpful. So we see this over and over again. This, this as the original temptation repeated in our own lives. And so we see that death right away. They immediately feel guilt. Right? They don't go, they don't eat and, go, oh, oh, and have a coronary and fall dead. Poison apple. They uh, immediately feel guilt. The disconnection from God. And so that's the question I have. Three questions as we wrap up. How many opportunities do they have to repent in this? Well, right when they felt guilt, they could have repented. Right? You know, you can do that without being, being confronted by another. You have to wait for your parents to find out about it, and then you confess it. And say You can go up preemptively and say, hey, I feel really bad. I did the following. But they don't do that. They cover it up. And then God asks them, where are you? What have you done? And they blame other people, each other, or Satan, someone else. And then we have the imposition of natural evil culminating in from dust you came to dust you shall return. That, that got serious fast. Well, either it's too serious or it's so serious because the offense is so serious. And since God is perfect in his wisdom, we know it's that one, which means we should pay attention to how serious the offense is. And you get this great thing now to think about. From dust you came, to dust you shall return. So do we see Adam repent? I think we do. Immediately after that pronouncement. Because the great temptation would be to say, I'm out of here. Eve ruined my life. I'm never talking to her again. I'm going to get a piece of chalk. I'm going to draw a line down Eden. And she'll stay on that side and I'll stay on this side all la Isla Lucy. Right? I think she drew it so that her husband had no access to the door to leave the room. His side of the bedroom was isolated inside. So... Does he repent? Yeah, he immediately says, not, I don't want to be around Eve, and I'm never having kids. I'm not bringing a kids into a world like this. It's getting hotter and hotter, right? He says, uh, no, this is Eve, meaning she'll be the mother of all living. That shows repentance. I'm going to keep the commandment I was given by God. And then why were they driven from the garden? I've had this question recently. If we repent of our sin and we're forgiven, why do we still die? Well, that's connected to this need for sanctification. So we could talk about that another time. Why do Christians still die physically? But all of the suffering of life is because of our need to be sanctified. To come to a greater understanding of the truth. So biblical worldview, how we've summarized it, and what we see in the three concepts, creation, fall, and redemption in Genesis 1 through 3. Let's end with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you that we are able to be together and study your word. And we, and we thank you for this glorious word, beginning with that Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We pray for faithfulness in our understanding of it and in our witness. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, look at him.
I might hit you up. Welcome. It's nice to see everyone this morning. We've come to worship the Lord. Let's prepare our hearts with a time of silent prayer. Hear the call to worship from Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Let's stand and sing from Psalm 95a. Oh, come and to Jehovah sing, let us our voices raise, in joyful songs let us arrive, of our salvation before his presence let us come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing songs to him with grace, with shouts let us rejoice. The Lord a mighty God and King above all gods he the depths of earth are in his hands, the mountain peaks are his. To him the spacious sea belongs, t'was made by his command, and by the working of his hands, he formed the rising land. 
Let's pray. All gracious and ever blessed God, we come before you in public worship to glorify your name. The earth is yours and everything in it. Psalm 95 reminds us of your work in creation. You work in the greatest events, even to the least detail, and bring about your glory. And there's nothing greater for us than to enjoy you by knowing your glory revealed in all your works. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us today and so enliven us that we might set aside anything that hinders us in that race that is set before us and renew us in the knowledge of the truth. Revive us as we turn to you. Allow us to be focused, be sharp, to not have a dull mind. Allow us to calm those troubles that come to our minds during the service that distract us from your word. Focus our attention. Let us hear your word and sing your psalms that we may be brought into an ever-increasing faithfulness. And be with us as we pray the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll now have a psalm meditation by Brandon on Psalm 25. All right, good afternoon. Today we'll be taking a look at Psalm 25. And this is a, a boring psalm, but uh, only for the worldly wise. As our pastor pointed out in last week's sermon on 1 Corinthians 3, even we as Christians can start to adopt the thinking of the world. We tend to believe that when we pray, we need to offer complex prayers with really sophisticated theological nuance or be certain that we use three dollar words because that's what reformed folks do and more especially uh, that's what reformed folks do who like to study philosophy well this psalm stands in stark contrast to that way of thinking this is direct and it's explicit and non-confusing it resonates in our lives because it is so enduringly precise the fact that our children can sing it with understanding does not make it any less, it actually makes it more. The psalm provides us with the basics of what we want to cling to in our lives and what we would hope our children would cling to and their children after them. And so while I don't think we have time to read the full thing, it certainly is gonna come out in 25C when we sing, but we have a little, uh, little sampling here. Verse one, for example, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. Verse seven, do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Verse 15, my eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. And then also verse 20, guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. And so as humans, we just want to be safe. We do all that we can to not be vulnerable or exposed. The trouble is we can't actually protect ourselves. In one of his sermons, Martin Luther King spends considerable time on this. Basically for thousands of years, humans have sought to protect themselves. And so we try to do that with money or whatever money can buy, often trying to get some kind of uh, provision or, or some way to insulate ourselves from harm. But the problem is, and this is what David identifies, uh, we, we can't do this. There's really two problems in trying on our own to provide our own protection. The first is that whatever means we try to acquire, rather it's, whether it's weaponry or position or whatever it might be, um, that's eventually going to decay or someone else is going to outmaneuver us eventually. But the second and more pressing issue David sees here is that we can't protect ourselves from what affects us most. And that's our own evil. David pleads with the Lord that he would forgive his sin because there's nothing that we can invent or buy or even steal 
that can keep us away from our own inclination to act against the way we've been created. Nothing external can keep us from our sin. So what we need to see and what David here lays out for us to the Lord is that we cannot save ourselves from our own suffering, but we, we try really hard. Learning that and really learning that should point us back to the fact that we cannot escape our own sin either. But the Lord works his plan for us and he covers our sin. He will protect us and provide for us far more than we deserve. And so amidst our fears and our worries about the sufferings that might befall us or the trials that might come our way, we are to turn to him. And it's in turning to him that we see that he can save us from our evil, from the thing that is most fearful, to continue on and on in the emptiness of spiritual death. And I especially appreciate Owen was mentioning this in, uh, in Sunday school about Augustine's realization of that, right? That the, as I understand it, the, the pleasures that he was seeking that were deep, driving him deeper into spiritual death, that those were telling him that that was, that was where life is found. And he realized uh, that's not where life is found. It's quite the opposite. That's where, where emptiness is found. And so this Psalm, Psalm 25, prays the simple things, but the simple things are the most important. We are saved from our sin and from our enemies by the Lord. Nothing else and no one else will protect us as individuals or as a community of believers. And so may that fundamental truth inspire our hearts, but more fully may it animate our lives each day. Let us sing with praise to the Lord for his unspeakable mercies. We'll now stand and sing Psalm 25C together. The Lord is good and just, the way he'll sinners show. The meek in judgment he will guide and make his path to know. O pathways of the Lord are truth and mercy sure. To such as keep his covenant and testimonies pure. Now for thy own name's sake. O Lord, I he entreat to pardon my iniquity, for it is very great. Who fears the Lord is taught the way to understand. His soul shall ever dwell at ease, his seed possess the land. The secret of the Lord shall all who fear him know. The knowledge of his covenant he unto them will show. My eyes upon the Lord continually are set. For he it is that shall bring forth my feet out of the net. Maybe seated. Thank you, Brandon. In Sunday school, we we're going over our the, the need for scripture and what we should look for in scripture, specifically God's redemptive message. And this starts there right away. Right? In Psalm 25C, it just begins with God will show the way to sinners. How profound. In verse 14, imagine this. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. So we know that the fear of the Lord connects up with wisdom. But here, David puts also friendship with God. And that sinners can be friends with God. So our, our, the scripture is given to us by God, which teaches his path of redemption. Now, by way of announcements... First and obvious is a big thank you to everyone involved in last night's Reformation Day fun festival fall extravaganza, right? <laughs> Especially uh, Kyle and Ashley. We had this at their house and a ton of work went into that. 
and Jonathan and Beth Ann who organized it and everyone pitched in, right? So thanks to everyone, but especially both of you families for all the work you put into it. And it was a big success. We had a number of people from other churches uh, thankful for us, thankful for what we're doing and starting good connections there. So this is the beginning of many uh, yearly events, not, not just this one, but we'll be having other events throughout the year. We'll have events like this, which are obviously family focused. We also will have this more academic one coming up, the general relation conference in February and I encourage you to sign up on there on the web page. So you'll be part of the mailing list for that and uh, tell others, you know, other churches are at work about it so they can sign up as well. It's on the generalrelation.com web page, because even if you're, uh, not able to go or you know someone who lives somewhere else we will have the zoom option and we'll also be recording the talks for future uh yesterday i kept it to about five minutes didn't i it's pretty good uh, but i did put together a little booklet to share well for adults and for children but going over what is the reformation what a reformation is compared to say a revival foundational truth, uh, a scripture verse from 1 Corinthians about the foundation in Christ, and then the five solas. And I ended that side with a question, what would be necessary to have a reformation in our day? So I put that together. I'm going to add to it each year so it get bigger and bigger, but this is like the good starting point, the good first place to begin. And then I sent an email last night about our Wednesday schedule. We're going to shift to just Zoom for a number of reasons. One is that it's a little bit easier to record them. It accommodates people's schedules. And I also sent a schedule for the rest of this semester. I'll probably put that together in the winter for the whole spring. So you have that ahead of time. Um, so, you know, I think you have to remind me now. We're going over John Locke and the argument that the soul exists. Those are separate. No. Oh, yeah, well, we, yeah, matters on eternal. Now we're, at least the readings are the following. Locke, John Owen, Calvin, and Luther. So four, those four readings for the rest of the semester. And let's think of good clickbait titles for them. Locke's Sinister Reason for Proposing Tolerance. Would you wonder what that is? You click on that one, you? All right. So announcements, now we'll wait on you for tithes and offerings. These are, this is part of how we worship God and recognizing that he owns all that we have. Let's stand and pray. Merciful and loving Heavenly Father, we often come before you with many needs and a troubled mind. Please comfort us in a knowledge of your care and your grace in our lives. We have sin that harms us and seems to retain a hold over us at times. Give us that freedom that can only be found in sanctification by your truth. Free us from the remaining unbelief that entangles our lives. We thank you for your work in the church through history and how this has led to where we're at today. And thank you for all those who worked and served yesterday so the Reformation Day event was such a success. We pray that our church should have a faithful witness in the Phoenix area. And we ask for mercy on those who struggle with lingering illness to give them healing and hope. And we think today of your church in the world and its weakened condition, many times violently persecuted we pray for protection and uh, on those in that condition. Revive your church that she might be a mighty witness to the challenges facing us and to the sin that ensnares. Receive these offerings as we affirm that all we have is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we'll sing from Psalm 143c. Ra 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 Lord, hearken to my prayer, my. 
Christ's supplication here, replied in truth and in righteousness. And with your servant now to judgment do not come, for in your sight no man is just. The foe has hounded me, my life to earth he crushed, and to me kept me as those long dead. My spirit therefore faints within me, overwhelmed my heart in me is as I days of old recall, I muse on all your deeds, I ponder long what your hands have wrought. I stretch my hands to you, my soul longs after you, as first a dry and desert. Haste, Lord, to answer me. Oh, how my spirit fails. Hide not the light of your face from me. Lest I become like those who to the pit go down. No, let me not with them descend. Let me your mercy hear when morning light appears. I flee to you for my hiding place. Teach me to know the way. Show me how I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from all my enemies, that you may hide me, I flee to you. Teach me to your will, my God of spirit, good, oh, make me dwell in a bright land. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, deal graciously with me, freely my soul in your righteousness. My foes lay in your grace, destroy my enemies, because I am your servant true. Maybe seated. Greg Goodrich will now come up and have the scripture reading and the sermon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 16 today, and particularly verses 25. So, chapter 16, verse. Uh, uh oh, got my reading off here. Bear with me. on the back side. Sorry about that. So Acts chapter 16, verses 25 through 34. Hear the word of God. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword 
and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Now we will uh, be singing from 119b. Da 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 da. How shall a young man cleanse his way? Let him with care thy word observe. With all my heart I have desired. From thy commands let me not swerve. Thy word I treasured in my heart, that I did no offense to thee. Thou, O Jehovah, blessed art, thy statutes teach thou unto me. I with my lips have oft declared the judgments which thy mouth has shown. More joy thy testimonies gave than all the riches I have known. I on thy precepts meditate and have respect to all thy ways. I in thy statutes will delight, thy word remember all my days. Well, good afternoon again. Today we're going to be looking at, uh, I think, uh, Malloy for this. He started me out uh, at the end of 15, and uh, I've got to deal with Paul and Barnabas separating. So that should be interesting. And then uh, continue on through chapter 16. So we uh, had read from the portion on the uh, centurion or the uh, Philippian jailer being saved and we will be anticipating that by thinking on the joy that was experienced there, not only by him who came from darkness to the light, but also those who were able to bring that light. We recently learned in a sermon from our pastor that the, uh, really the pillar of what we are as Christians is found as Christ and him crucified. Um, That should be affirmed week by week in our lives. And uh, so when we think about coming into this dispute between Paul and Barnabas and the rest of chapter 16, we should be thinking about how this will apply to us, uh, how it applies to um, strife, our own seeking, and our own sharing of the gospel. So think on your friendships and your marriages. Uh, Maybe you're not married, Uh, Maybe you're even a child, right? And so your friendships are just blossoming as you you are yourself very young. Um, They should be aimed at advancing the kingdom of God. So when you're cultivating those friendships and marriages, obviously strife is going to come up. How many arguments? Just think about, uh, you know, what fraction or what's the ratio of arguments that you've been able to settle by aggressively asserting that the dispute must be resolved right now. It's got to happen right now. 
Everything that you just said needs to be dealt with right now. Um, well, I, in my, as I reflect on my marriage, <laughs> that has not gone well. So <laughs> things, things need to uh, sit for a bit. I need to reflect on a plank that may be in my own eye. Um, and obviously, many of us have had planks in our eyes and we've not seen them. And so eventually we should learn, yeah, it's, I, I don't see it. I don't see how I could be wrong, but it's there. And so uh, also we might think, must every minute misunderstanding be corrected right now or this week or this month? So as we think about advancing our marriages, again, we're going to apply this large, more uh, broadly to advancing the kingdom. And I want to begin and conclude with three ideas that I'm drawing from uh, chapter 16 and this latter par portion of uh, chapter 15. First, it's about strife. Even as strife may harm our natural affections, we can still work together in the same church and advance the kingdom. Second, we ought to be praying, serving, and seeking out opportunities to find believers and unbelievers who we can bless with what we know. And lastly, our joy together as we walk together can and should be a primary motivation for active service and witness. So coming into this latter portion of Acts 15, verses 36 through 41, we see that after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This relationship between Barnabas and Paul, as we know it, began in chapter 9. We saw there that Barnabas was the one who took Paul and brought him in among the apostles and other disciples that otherwise would have greatly feared Paul. So Barnabas brought him in and declared the faithfulness that he had already heard in Paul, and so others came to trust him. Also, another important context here is that uh, their first missionary journey, uh, when they departed from Antioch down into Cyprus and then eventually uh, up into the, the Greek mainland, we see that, do we have a map? Okay, so you can see the, the yeah, come, the, the first missionary journey here. Uh, I can't quite see it from this angle. Um, hopefully you can, can see it down on the bottom. They're beginning in Antioch, coming down to Cyprus. That's when John Mark leaves them, right? The blue line coming down into Cyprus. He leaves them and goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, Paul and Barnabas continue on up the blue line comes over uh, to Antioch in Pisidia and then down into Derby. Um, remember, he's going to have some persecution there in Lystra, and then they're going to come back over and sail back to Antioch. That's their first missionary journey. So as uh, th what, it, what is it that's motivating them to do this? Well, we see that there's a persecution that had broken out in chapter 11, and that... Uh, excuse me, in chapter 11, we see that there was a persecution earlier that had broken out surrounding Stephen's martyrdom. And the disciples had scattered from Jerusalem and went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. So two main points uh, that we're going to be speaking about today are going to be Cyprus and, and then Antioch uh, there north of Jerusalem. Antioch ends up being a fortified uh I guess, a bulwark for the kingdom of God. Uh, they are going to play a, a major role in calling on Jerusalem to settle this issue with the Hellenists and with the, the zealots that are saying you need to be circumcised to be saved. That's actually a call that comes, in my understanding, from Antioch to the, 
the disciples and apostles in Jerusalem to answer this problem. So Antioch is a, a big part of the church at this point. Uh, Barnabas is after upon hearing that they're having some success there in Antioch with conversion of Hellenists and others, he goes up to encourage those people and exhorts them to be faithful and be steadfast uh, in, in their service to the Lord. Antioch also will supply Jerusalem when uh, there's a famine that a prophet foresees, and uh, so Antioch supports them financially as well. And then in chapter 11, we see after in this context that Saul uh, is brought back uh, to Barnabas and they go to Antioch and they serve there for about a year together. When they go on the first missionary journey, that's about an 18 month journey minimally. So this is about two and a half years that they're, you know, getting close, okay, um, on the road together. So John Mark is there assisting them in chapter 13, we see. And we see that John Mark, uh, in assisting them, you have Silas, Paul, Barnabas, these individuals here together. We have Elymas, the, the magician, if you recall. He's uh, opposing the gospel. And then Paul, uh, being inspired by the Lord to strike him blind, does so. And Elymas loses his sight. At that point, then, they decide to go on um, from Cyprus up to Pamphylia. John Mark, again, goes back to Jerusalem. This is uh, obviously going to be brought up here as the occasion for the dispute between Paul and Barnabas. How should we understand this? It's a sharp dispute between them that caused them to separate and we don't have any indication that they ever work together again. We know um, that Barnabas was likely the uh, brother of Mary, who was the mother of John Mark. Uh, if you recall, I know we're doing some background here. Peter, uh, when he was in prison, came out of prison, went to a house where people were praying, Christians were praying, knocked on the door. That was Mary's house, okay? That was John Mark's mother's house in Jerusalem. So uh, Barnabas had family ties. Was he being drawn toward those family ties to say, no, he, he really needs to go with us? Was Paul justified in thinking that John Mark couldn't take uh, any suffering that might come up? Well, when I look at what they experienced in Cyprus, I don't see any suffering. Right. So maybe Paul knew eventually suffering could come. But I'm led to wonder, uh, did John Mark have some obligations maybe to his mother in Jerusalem? Did he not? Uh, was it justified? Was it unjustified? Um, could could his concerns wait? Could they not wait? These are all details that may be shielded from us. I don't know that we can say uh, that. He couldn't have endured the suffering that later Paul's going to endure in prison with Silas or not. But we can take away some things from this. We can say that John Mark should be really grateful to have Barnabas, who is going to take him and work with him. And then they, they actually sail back down after this dispute. They sail back down to Cyprus. Okay, so they're going to minister there. So that ministry does continue although we don't see that continue in Acts. And then Paul is going to go from Antioch, and you can see the, uh, I think it's purple, up into Cilicia and then to Derby, and then continuing back through. So he's taking Silas on that journey. So two uh, very uh, important men in the early church here, continuing their ministries after a dispute. I don't think that Paul later could tell us that we should settle a dispute before bringing our sacrifice if, we, if, if this was not actually occurring here. I don't see any discipline from the church on, um, excuse me, on Paul, obviously. He's commended and, and sent off, but I also don't see any discipline coming on Barnabas. So I would think that they said uh, something like, well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree and we're going to go our own ways. 
it would have been nice had they if they could have done that before they had a sharp dispute, right? So hopefully we can learn to do that in our own lives before we have a sharp dispute to see what are the possibilities here, right? Um, is it that we have to, obviously you and your wife have to continue on, right? But uh, maybe you go to the store so she doesn't have to because she's got a lot of uh, stress or something. I'm not sure what the exact occasion would be, but uh, we can find some ways to resolve this before we hit this sharp dispute, okay? It's not just as I see it. The Lord is doing some other work, perhaps. And Paul and Barnabas may have needed to separate in the Lord's providence here. Um, and so obviously we see that it would have been better had there not been strife. And there could be sin on both parts. I don't see any reason to think that that would not be the case. We do know that John Mark is going to come back and be called by Paul um, because he's going to be very useful to Paul. So um, we, sh we should be weighing this in our hearts as we read the scripture. We can know that God sovereignly worked through the sin of men to accomplish his purpose and that these great men are going out and saturating various churches throughout the kingdom. Okay, so we leave Barnabas here knowing that he bore much fruit in both his ministry to and with Paul and in the lives of others, including John Mark. Paul, again, uh, will later have ministry with John Mark, um, but we don't, again, see anything of Barnabas. Paul chooses Silas. Silas is likely the Sylvanus of Paul's letters. That was new for me. I, I hadn't connected that. I'm slow, maybe. He was a Hellenistic Jew who had come to Christ, and the first time he appears in Scripture is when he is sent out with Judas, Paul, and Barnabas to go from Jerusalem after the Council of Jerusalem to go north to Antioch to proclaim what had been decided by the Council. In Galatians uh, 2-3, we see an individual come up. Uh, this is Titus. And we see there that uh, the sign with the Council of Jerusalem deciding that the sign is not the reality, right? Circumcision is not necessary in order to be saved. We see that that is affirmed um, with Titus. But we're going to see here in chapter 16 that we meet an individual. His name's Timothy, and he ends up being a primary disciple of Paul, and he is circumcised. And this might be troubling for some, but we should just recognize, hey, it's not about salvation. Paul doesn't think it's about salvation. Timothy doesn't think it's about salvation. This is about Timothy's ability to be able to minister to the Jews that are there. Uh, very clearly in verse uh, 3, we see that his father was a Greek, and so he would not have been circumcised, and others may have known that. But because of the Jews in that region... He was circumcised. And so from that, being given this occasion that Timothy could begin ministry, perhaps anticipating that this is going to be on his own in the future, uh, he is circumcised. And the churches in that area are strengthened in the faith, and they increase in numbers daily. So can we learn from this? We've said that Christ and him crucified is a stumbling block that is there for the unbeliever. But that was set there by God, right? That stumbling block was set by God, not set by us. Should we place other stumbling blocks in the way of those we minister to in order to sift the wheat from the chaff, right? Timothy's not going to be circumcised because you all are wrong. You don't understand that the sign is not the reality. We're not going to circumcise him. You guys need to just deal with your unbelief, your problem. Uh, that's not the attitude that I see here in Paul. I see instead that Paul is understanding of the situation and these blocks that may be in their understanding that are going to be worked out eventually. They do need to be worked out. It's not just tolerance for tolerance sake without end. But for right now, the circumcision is going to occur so that he can minister and that block isn't there in their thinking. So what is important? At what point would we say, y'all need to just deal with it? Christ and him crucified, right? 
That's what God put there as a block. So it seems to me that God uh, desires that we honor that um, in not compromising, obviously, Christ and him crucified. But anything less than that, we need to be very careful to approach a people based upon their own tradition and understanding and bring them to Christ and him crucified and work um, through preaching the word to them, work that sanctification in their lives. So Paul and Silas continue to teach the gospel by means of the judgment of the church at the Council of Jerusalem. This is the purpose for going out, and the churches are strengthened by this, and their numbers grow daily. That would be nice, right? Uh, I was thinking just this morning, and uh, Pastor Anderson mentioned it, when, when is the next Reformation happening? And I thought, why not in our day? It's not going to be us, but why not, why not in our day? I'm ready to see it. I, I want to see the Lord's works. Um, perhaps it won't be in our day, but uh, why not, right? So let's work toward that and be strengthened, strengthen others, and look to increase our numbers, those that are redeemed from darkness to light. Okay, the next passage we have is the Macedonian call. We read there in verse 6 of chapter 16, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, we sought to go out into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here, I see man's ingenuity and wisdom humbled. I see uh, if I'm in Paul's shoes or uh, Silas's shoes, I'm thinking, yeah, this makes sense. Let's let's go off to the east. Um for whatever reason, that was where their mind was set. And they're told, no. By the spirit of Jesus, they are told, you're not going east. Uh, you're not going up into Cilicia, up into Galatia. You're going west. Okay. And so how pivotal is that going to be for the individuals that we confront later in this chapter? If they had gone the other direction, those that we see at Philippi, here in uh, uh, Macedonia, so the far, uh, I guess your left, the far left, you're seeing uh, the most uppermost portion of the missionary journeys, you see Philippi there. They would not have come anywhere near there had this not occurred. And you see this Macedonian man. How did he know he was Macedonian? Well, uh, whatever the details may be, this Macedonian man is saying, come up to Macedonia. I guess that's how he knows he's from Macedonia. And he's, uh, he's saying, come over and help us. Come and help us. And so this is given by God. Paul understands it to be given by God. And directly, immediately, they change course. There's no pride. There's no kicking against the goads that, you know, that was there uh, in the old Saul right? Nope. He's uh, heading off to do what God has asked him to do. And so we now uh, approach verses 11 through 15, and we see here the conversion of Lydia. Lydia is a citizen of Philippi, and this is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. They remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. So they're there for a number of days already. It doesn't seem that there's a lot of connection being made. Maybe they're getting some food in the marketplace. They're trying to strike up conversation. Nothing seeming to connect. But they think, well, maybe down near the waterside, um, there's a place of prayer. And so they go and they see the women praying. Now, was it just that men 
haven't shown up yet. Uh, maybe this was just women getting together and praying while the men are, were working. Um, you know, women, they have all that free time, right? <laughs> Not having to watch uh, kids or anything like that. So it's soap operas or prayer, right? Um, no. So uh, this was a place of prayer, and uh, they sit down and begin speaking to the women. And Lydia is a seller of purple goods. This is a, a royal color, right? So she's probably wealthy, able to um, sell these to uh, the higher class. And she is a worshiper of God. So she's already a believer. Okay, She's already a believer. How many times in your life and your opportunities for witness do you say, you know, they're already Christian. Um, I don't know if I need to really disturb them by asking them if, you know, they've thought about the songs that they sing or what's going to happen after they die. Do they believe in the resurrection? Obviously they should, right? Um, we, we would hope so. But we have these excuses, right? Maybe that uh, I've got to go, you know, I got to go home or I got to go by the grocery store and uh, take care of my, my life. Um, we see these men are devoted to this task. They've sacrificed everything. This is the moment that they're given and they're seeking every opportunity that they can. And what comes of it? The Lord opens the heart of a woman who had already believed in him to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and then she's baptized, and her household as well, and she urges them to come in um, and stay in her house, and uh, they do so. So now they have a strong connection with a notable, respectable woman and her family in Philippi. Verse 16, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out. These men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So she kept doing this for a few days and annoying them. And finally, Paul, in his patience, this has been going on for days. This is not a sudden outburst immediately. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But she was owned. And those who owned her were making profit by her fortune telling. So they dragged Paul and Silas, having stolen their property, they dragged Paul and Silas into the marketplace before the rulers and when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. And they make their case against them. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders. I'm imagining at this point, because we'll see later how important it is to notice that they are Roman citizens, that Paul is probably saying, we're Roman citizens, we're Roman citizens, but it's chaos. No one can hear them. So they inflicted many blows upon them. They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And so we have our focus for the week here in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And we know not just the prisoners, but also the jailers, right? And so we have... Uh, maybe a, a, a question about what we would be doing. If I was here in this situation, would I be singing? What would I be singing? And we see this joy that Paul and Silas have together in the work that they're doing. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And the jailer woke. Why was he asleep? Well, they were fastened, right? Probably behind a cage. Then the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Think of the darkness here. He may in the Roman mind, be doing the honorable thing, the just thing. But this is it. This is, this is it. 
your whole life up to now, 10 minutes of not paying attention, and your first thought is to grab the sword and thrust yourself through. That's a darkened mind. That's you are made in the image of God. If Rome does not understand that you're made in the image of God, let yourself be brought up to court, right? This is not the honorable way to go. And in that darkness now, we see the switch that occurred in his mind when he sees and realizes that Paul and Silas are still there. Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer calls for the lights. The fires come in. Tr he's trembling with fear and falls down at the feet of Paul and Silas. And what's his first response? Sirs, we, we, we should be reading this every year and let this affect us. This is a man in darkness that is there because Christ chose that they would go west and not east. Do not harm yourself, for we all are all here. And the jailer called for lights. Excuse me, I'm repeating myself. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him. He takes them into his own house. He washes their wounds. They baptize him. And here in verse 34, we see that he rejoices along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Philippi is now being established as a major fortified city for the kingdom of God. And so day comes and they say, the, the magistrates come and they say, let these men go. Paul says they've struck us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, they've thrown us into prison, and do they now put us out secretly? These magistrates know if Caesar were to know this, they would be executed. So now they're coming in silence and wanting me to just leave. Well, if I just leave, what's that going to mean for the church broadly? In all of Rome, we should know that Roman citizens were beaten in Philippi and that these magistrates should die if they're going to hold to their own law. No, let them come themselves and take, the, take us out. And so they reported to the magistrates. They came, apologized, took them out, and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. And so, as we look at this chapter, I see the very active, ongoing reality of the advancing of the kingdom. And obviously, in our day, we're trying to identify exactly how is it that I and my talent and the talent of others and maybe strife that occurs between us, how do we see the, the kingdom continue advancing? How do we respond in the midst of that strife? How do we respond in um, these circumstances in the marketplace or uh, wherever we might be. Well, we not each and every time are we going to be able to spend the time to go to someone, but Christ does seek us out to have us go uh, where he chooses. And we need to be ready and willing and seeking. It's not uh, me who lives in this body, but it's Christ, Galatians 2.20. So let him live in me. And so in conclusion, in advancing the kingdom, thinking about this again in the three points, we have strife, we should be seeking, and we should be sharing. Even as strife harms our natural affections, we can still work together in the same church and advance the kingdom. Paul and Barnabas are, uh, I believe, paragon, it's, both are paragons, uh, examples of continuing to do the work in spite of the strife. Seeking, we ought to be praying, serving, and seeking out opportunities to find believers and unbelievers who can bless, who we can bless with what we know. And, and maybe at this point we say, but well, that seems so presumptuous. And so we're working through that, right? 
Because in our culture, if you come and think that you can teach another believer something that's going to help them in their life, well, that's really proud of you, right? Uh, or coming to an unbeliever and saying that you actually know the truth in this postmodern age, as if there's a meta narrative. Are you crazy? Um, so we we should be very ready to have those silenced in our minds so that we can move forward with boldness and proclaim what we have been given and entrusted with so that others can gain from it. And we see that with Lydia. We see that with the Philippian jailer. And then in totality, we see Lydia and the Philippian jailer there in Philippi. We see Paul and Silas there together uh, sharing in joy, whether they're in the prison singing psalms, whether they're uh, going after being released now to Lydia's house. They're walking together. And this walking together and the joy that they're experiencing in advancing the kingdom and knowing God together, this should be a motivation for our act of service and witness. We should want that. We should desire it. We should be praying for it. We should be waking up in the morning, going to bed at night, yearning for this together. So um, let's thank the Lord for his word. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives that you have brought us here. We recognize that your church has been established in the West because of what we see in this chapter, where we might have our own ideas about how history should go. We may think that um, clarity should have been there in the first century and um, everything should have been resolved by the second. But that is not how you are working out your providence in history. You are cleansing your bride as you will to cleanse her. And we pray that we would um, understand this, that we would humble ourselves uh, as Paul did, that we would be ready to turn on a, on a dime, that we would go west and that we would um, recognize that your sovereign providence have, has brought us to here and that we would take hope in the midst of the darkness that we see around us, that uh, you will lead your church into greater understanding and greater light and greater unity together. Help us to have confidence in that, that we can um, understand how to apply your word in the midst of strife, uh, that we would not tolerate for tolerance sake, but that we would be able to work together as one church. And we pray uh, that we would take joy together as a church and with other churches in the glorious work that you have done in our own lives and that you are doing in the lives of many throughout the nations, even today, um, that are experiencing that awakening uh, that the Philippian jailer had when he was ready to end his life and yet within moments experienced the greatest joy and salvation that he could have ever imagined. We pray that you would watch over us and keep us as we go out today, uh, that we would uh, be excited about the work that we have before us and that we would hope and pray and anticipate a future reformation where greater uh, understanding is gained. We pray and ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Now we'll sing from Psalm, Psalm? 107. 107B. Thank you. I'm the one who chose that. Stand and sing. Stand and sing. Da 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 Some people in the darkness live in that shaded of the prisoners of misery with chains of iron tied. Because against the words of God they in rebellion turn, and counsel of the one most high they had despised and spurned. He 
therefore humbled them with toil, they fell without redress. In trouble to the Lord they cried, He saved them from distress. He brought them out of darkness, rain, and took them from the shade. He broke apart the iron bands which had them helpless made. Let them give thanks unto the Lord for all his kindness shown, and for his work so wonderful which he to men makes known. For he the mighty gates of bronze has shattered with a stroke. He cut the bars of iron off and them asunder broke. Maybe seated. We come now to the Lord's Supper which is a memorial of his atoning death and signifies abiding in Christ and feeding spiritually upon him. Its observation marked continuance in and loyalty to the visible church on the part of those who have been baptized. The symbols are the bread and the cup. The sacramental acts performed today remind us of Christ's death. And it's the privilege of every member to observe the Lord's Supper regularly and with due preparation of our hearts. For those who are joining us, you're welcome to participate insofar as you understand Christ to be your Savior. We should remember Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, his words of institution, beginning in verse 27 or beginning in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he also reminded us and warned us to not do this thoughtlessly. In verse 27, Wherefore, therefore, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat and drink the bread and the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment, on himself. Today, while we we will do what we've been doing, which is form a line and come up to one of the two tables here. And while we're doing that, we'll sing Psalm 116a. Do we have that ready? We won't do that today. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make that our practice going forward that during this time we'll sing 116a, maybe other songs, but we'll normally do that. Uh, do you have, you know that one, right? 116a? And then after, we'll sing 45, which is a psalm about uh, God and the church, the king and his bride, and directs our attention to his victory and the, the final wedding. I'm going to have uh, Greg Malloy and Brandon Crow come up. Presentation of the bread, Christ's body broken for us.
and the presentation of the wine, Christ's blood spilled for us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you now in remembrance of your redemptive work, your death for us on the cross. We pray you would bring to mind those sins that we need to confess to you and give us the life, the power, the strength to overcome them in our life as we're sanctified in your word. We pray you'd bless so much of these elements of bread and wine as shall be used on this occasion to set apart for the sacramental use in the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ the King and Head of the Church. Amen. All right, um, form two lines. Are you able to? I think most of us know 116A, so we'll be up here and we'll sing that, and you can sing as you know it. We just don't have it projected. Da, 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 da. I love the Lord because he heard my supplicating plea. I, while I live, will call on him who bows his ear to me. The cords of death on every side encompass me around. The sorrows of the grave to cook I grief and trouble found. Then called I on Jehovah's name and unto him did say, Deliver thou my soul, O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. The Lord is gracious, and his trust our God will mercy show. The Lord preserves the meek in heart, he saves me when brought low. O thou, my soul, do thou return to thine own quiet rest. Because the Lord has dealt in grace, his bounty has thee blessed. Thou hast released my soul from death, my eyes from tears kept free. From falling thou hast saved my feet, I live and walk with thee. Let's stand together, and we'll sing from Psalm 45a. Da, 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 da. My heart doth overflow, a noble theme I see. My tongue's a skillful writer sent to speak about the King, to speak about the King. More fair than sons of men, thy lips with grace o'erflow, because his blessing evermore did God on thee be so, did God on thee. 
soul. Thy sword gird on thy thigh, O thou supreme mind, and gird thyself with majesty, and with thy splendor bright, and with thy splendor bright. To victory ride forth, for meekness, truth, and right. And lay thy right hand teach to thee the deeds of dreadful might, the deeds of dreadful might. Thine arrow sharpened in heart, men unto thee to bring. To pierce the heart of enemies who fight against the king, who fight against the king. Hear the benediction from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We'll close with the doxology 150b. Da, da, da. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise Him with the trumpet sound, praise Him with the harp and lyre, praise Him with timbrel and dancing, praise Him with string instruments and pipe, praise Him with loud cymbals, praise Him with resounding cymbals, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You're dismissed. Go in the peace of God.